Celebration. Celebration. <laughs> okay. Well, it's not really working. There we go. Okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk about wisdom. But we're going to talk about it in the context of tonight. I'm going to go over some more stuff about Revelation. I think you guys are interested in that. I certainly am. And there's a lot of stuff that's happening right now that I think pertains to that. So that'll be good to chat about today. Um, but before we do that, I want to look at Job chapter 28. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there to Job chapter 28. And I'm going to read through this chapter. And uh, we're going to talk about wisdom. The wealth of wisdom. That's what today's topic is called. The wealth of wisdom. See this right here? This is wisdom. God calls it a crown of splendor. Got my little crown right here. So, uh, you guys are partially responsible for some of that over the years. It's been, uh, it's been a good journey. Lots of wisdom gained from experience in all places of life. So let's look at Job chapter 28, and we're going to read verse 1. Surely there is a mine for silver and a place for gold that they refine. Iron is taken out of the earth, and copper is smelted from the ore. Man puts an end to darkness and searches out to the farthest limit the ore in gloom and deep darkness. He opens shafts in a valley away from where anyone lives. They are forgotten by travelers. They hang in the air far away from mankind. They swing to and fro. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires, and it has dust of gold. Uh, that path no bird of prey knows, and out of the and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud beasts have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. All that to say, this is a really poetic way of saying there's a lot of deep things that are hidden in the earth, beautiful things, and everything that's on top of the earth has no idea that it's down there. It's only for those people who are willing to dig for it. So first principle there, are you willing to dig for wisdom? Uh, number nine, verse nine. Man puts his hand to the flinty rock and overturns mountains by the roots. He cuts out channels in the rocks, and his eye sees every precious thing. He dams up the streams so that they do not trickle, and the thing that is hidden he brings out to light. But where shall wisdom be found, and where is the place of understanding? Verse 13, I circled this in my Bible. Man does not know its worth, and it is not found in the land of the living. See, we don't know we don't know the real value of wisdom. We seek after all kinds of other things, don't we? We spend a lot of time digging for uh, empty wells, uh, for uh, shallow things that um, we, we, we move quickly on to the next hole because we don't find anything and we keep going. And we, we dig lots of shallow little holes, but rarely do we dig deep to find wisdom. And it's unfortunate because wisdom is worth, as this passage of scripture is going to say, far more than uh, the wealth of the world. So let's keep reading. Verse 14, the deep says, it is not in me. And the sea says, it is not in me. It cannot be bought for gold and silver cannot be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Verse 20, I circled as well. From where then does wisdom come? It's a good question. And that's something that we should be asking ourselves. Where can I find wisdom? I really, I'm, I really want it. I, I know that, I, that I'm reading, just reading this passage of scripture. Of course, this is Job, remember. Job is going through a lot of suffering at this point. But he is explaining something that is uh, really deep. See, uh, Job is one of the few people who has gone deep enough to understand where wisdom dwells. And even then, even with Job and all of his suffering, the things that he went through, 
he still, at the very end, says, I spoke of what I did not know, right? And he says, I repent in dust and ashes. So even he says, he, and, and he says, the Lord even says to Job, who is this that darkens my counsel with words without knowledge? So Job the, probably comes away from this whole experience, the wisest or one of the wisest men in the world, in history, uh, having gone through so much uh, and, and gone very deep and yet uh, just scratching the surface of the wisdom of God. So he's, he asks this question, verse 20, from where then does wisdom come and where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. In verse 23, God understands the way to it, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth, and he sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight, and apportioned the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain, and a way for the lightning and the thunder, then he saw and declared it, he established it, and searched it out. And, and these are really uh, beautiful ways of depicting the wisdom of God. You know, we look at lightning and we see it striking. God has a path for that. We don't. We still can't figure out how... I mean, we, we have patterns that we can recognize with weather. But we still can't predict things 100%, can we? We still don't know exactly where is the path of lightning. Where, where is it striking? Where are all the, ele the, the static electrons and all the little places where you know it's going to connect as a web does across the sky? If you've ever been out west and seeing lightning go ripple across the sky through the clouds. It's, it's incredible. Uh, huge thunder clouds that have uh, amazing displays of lightning. God knows the paths of all those things. And this is a way of describing his wisdom. Because if God knows things like that, we can be sure he knows the deep things of our hearts. And verse 28, the last thing here. He said to man, Behold, the fear of the Lord... The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to turn away from evil is understanding. To turn away from evil is understanding. So here at the end of this passage, Job states, even as he's going through this suffering, he says, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And he, he says, God knows the way to wisdom. Um, and so and in, in James chapter 1, uh, he says, if anyone asks God for wisdom, God will give it liberally, that means overwhelmingly, abundantly, without finding fault. And so one of the uh, prayers is, you know, you, you look at Solomon and God was so pleased with Solomon's prayer for wisdom that God added to Solomon's wisdom uh, wealth, uh, worldly wealth, and success in all that he did. Uh, he, he just, he overblessed. Solomon, because Solomon's request pleased God that, that Solomon desired wisdom so much. And so it's a precious thing. And it's precious to God that you should seek it. If you desire wisdom and you want to grow in your understanding and in your knowledge of God, and not just, not just of your knowledge of, of Him, but your knowledge in Him, like, like you want to know Him, uh, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Now, what is the fear of the Lord? Well, it, it's certainly for the believer in Christ, it's not being afraid of God, not, in, not certainly in the, in the sense of uh, punishment, but it is fear in the sense of God is powerful, God is mighty, uh, God is uh, strong, uh, he is uh, overwhelmingly uh, uh, jealous of, of his, the, those that he loves and will fight to the death, <laughs> literally. For, for those that he loves. Um, and so we, we fear God in the sense that we have great respect, great reverence, great awe, and terror in a sense that we know what he's capable of. Not terror in the, in the, in the sense that we are afraid that he's going to use that against us, but that we respect and know those on the wrong side of God and on the wrong side of his justice and his judgment uh, are going to feel the pain big time. And that should cause us to shudder uh, away from evil. But as we have that fear and that 
uh, respect of God, that, that great deep uh, reverence for his holiness and his majesty, out of that comes forth understanding. That desire to turn away from evil, which we have if we belong to Christ. We have a desire to turn away from evil. Now, it doesn't mean that we're successful 100% of the time, but it does mean that we are, we desire it. And, and it, it means that we're seeking it and pursuing it. And when we come to God with that attitude, that we fear Him, we respect Him, we reverence Him deeply, and we desire to turn away from evil, to shun evil, just like Job did, that's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of understanding. See, seeking knowledge is great, but seeking knowledge is not going to make you wise. It's not going to give you discernment. It's not going to help you make good decisions. But turning away from evil, that will help you make good decisions. Turning to God, respecting and reverencing Him, coming, coming into, into, His pres into His presence with, with wonder and with awe, with respect, uh, and at the same time, you know, as his children, knowing that we're not going to be punished, but that he defends us because he loves us so much. That should, that should really encourage us more than anything because the demons are afraid of him, really afraid of him. Satan is afraid of him, really afraid of him. Now, he doesn't, doesn't mean he doesn't challenge him from time to time. It doesn't mean he doesn't stand up to him. But a one-on-one -on -one match with Satan and God is, is, is nothing. Satan, Satan is only seeking to control circumstances to the point that he is, he is allowed to for a time being for the purpose of God. And that's, that's a short time in the, in the scheme of eternity. And it's for the purpose of you and me becoming more like him. Satan is a, is a catalyst, uh, a, a small part to play in our development as uh, becoming like God becoming like him, truly like him. Not just in the sense that he tempted Eve to be like God, but in the real sense of loving him, loving others. That's, that's the way God wants us to be. So, wealth in your spirit. That's what this is. This is wealth for your spirit. This is wealth for your soul. Uh, this, is, this is worth digging for. It's worth uncovering. And this is why I study Revelation. It's why I desire to study Revelation. It's why I desire to study the, the things in the scriptures that nobody else wants to study. Things that other pastors, other teachers will, will move away from. A lot of times I'm like, no, I want to know what that means. I want to know what that passage means. And so I just, I just dive right in. Uh, I want to get familiar with things. I want to get familiar with that. So as we talk tonight, uh, and I encourage you, as we read through... Uh, a little bit more in Revelation tonight. We're going to talk about some of the trumpets, the judgments that come uh, after the seals, um, as the seventh seal is opened and the trumpets begin. The judgment of God comes upon the world, and this is a good passage. If you want, you're talking about the fear of the Lord. These are good things to think about because it show it. W the way that we see the world right now is skewed in some ways because of our flesh, because of the uh, the sinful nature. We look at the things that are in the world right now and we go, huh, there's a lot of evil in the world and God isn't doing anything about it. Like he just seems to be sitting back and letting things happen, right? And that's true. But when we read Revelation, you see the reckoning. You see how it's been stored up, like how things have not gone unaccounted for. God has not lost track of all the stuff that has happened, past, present, and future. And every wicked thing, every uh, idle word will be brought into account. Everything that's spoken that we, we didn't think about, that's all going to be brought into account. It's not forgotten. So God, God doesn't turn his back on evil and just let it, let it go. He's not going to let, just let it go. And in Revelation, we see God actually dealing with evil, finally and completely. And uh, it's the same kind of uh, dealing with evil that we see in the cross, where God judges his son. But in this sense, it's a judgment that goes further because it's a judgment against those who have rejected his son. You see, anyone who has uh, rejected God and has sinned and fall short of the glory of God can come to God through Jesus Christ. But anyone who rejects Jesus Christ, anyone who turns away from Jesus and from the commandment to, to repent and to turn to him to find salvation, there is no salvation in any other name. There's no way to God 
in any other way than through Jesus Christ. So those who reject him, this is their judgment. You see, Jesus takes the judgment of those who have turned away from God, but have found consolation in Jesus Christ. We, we are not count, our sins are not counted against us because they are counted against Christ, which is incredible. But for those who reject the gift, for those who turn away from Jesus, this, this, is the, this is the justice that comes upon each person who does not believe in Jesus and who does not uh, repent. So we should fear in the sense that we should be in, awe, in reverence and in awe of a God who does not tolerate wickedness, a God who is holy and never changes. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same person that uh, said, you can't come on this mountain or you'll be killed. You can't touch the Ark of the Covenant or you'll be killed. Uh, you know, it's the same God who, in the New Testament, Ananias and Sapphira decide to lie about the money that they gave to the church. And Peter says, well, uh, you just lied against the Holy Spirit. Now you're going to go meet your maker. <laughs> and Ananias falls down at, at Peter's feet dead. Same God. And that struck fear into the hearts of everybody around them going, uh, we better not mess with this. We should not lie against, we should not lie to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> He's the same spirit of the New Testament, the Old Testament, that doesn't change. Now the covenants have changed. God's dealing with people has changed because we have the blood of Jesus. We can be cleansed from every sin, but that doesn't mean if we reject the blood of Jesus that God does not, does not uh, carry his judgment out. And the wrath of God remains. The wrath of God abides on the person who does not believe in Jesus Christ. So uh, tonight as we talk about a little bit more about Revelation, a little bit more reading, a little more uncovering, a little more digging, uh, I pray that you uh, will seek wisdom and that you will uh, have the fear of the Lord and the love of God in your heart. Uh, in the Old Testament, they had the fear of the Lord, which turned them away from wickedness and, and gave them wisdom. But they, they did not have, uh, like we have, they did not see how much God loves us. Uh, David scratched the surface. He, he knew God's love. He knew God's, uh, but he didn't know what, to what extent God was really willing to love. We do. We see uh, Jesus' love demonstrated for us on the cross. And it's powerful, powerful to show us that God deeply cares for us. And that he has made a way for us because he cares. So, uh, we'll read Revelation tonight. I want you to uh, look at uh, the next few chapters. We were in chapters uh, five and six, I think. And um, I may read also from Second Thessalonians, which talks about the man of sin being revealed, which comes right before the trumpets. Uh, so chapter six is the, is the seals. You're going to see the 144,000 sealed, which is Israel. Uh, and then we're going to look at chapter 8, uh, the seventh seal and the golden censer. Okay? And we'll, we'll read a little bit out of that at, a, at a chapter 8 and a little bit out of chapter 9. Um, and we'll have some more fun talking about that stuff tonight. Okay? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your wisdom that you give to each person who asks. And I pray, Lord, that we would seek you for that wisdom and we would be willing to dig deeply to unearth the treasure that is there, Lord, uh, that, that eyes don't see normally and people are not willing to listen and, and understand. But for those of us, Lord, that are willing to dig deeply, to spend time with you, to seek your face, to turn away from evil, you will reveal wisdom and give us discernment to help us decide uh, moral things, to help us decide practical things, um, that we would please you and follow your ways, be more like you every day. We bless your holy name, God. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the gift of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us to respect him and reverence him and honor him in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you tonight, guys.